I want to trade her in. Just released. <laughs> I'll take her. Ah, GameStop. Chances are you remember this as an absolute icon if you were a 90s kid. Maybe it's where you got your first Game Boy or where you finally found that copy of Pokemon Red. It's also probably where you got ripped off trying to make a few extra dollars selling your old games to the guy behind the counter who told you they were worth $2 each when they represented an entire old chapter of your childhood. Am I getting too personal? Well, maybe. But if you look up GameStop now, the biggest controversy you'll find them involved in is that short squeeze from a couple years back. For those of you that don't know, didn't understand or forgot what happened, let me break it down. As the pandemic was in full swing, a bunch of brick and mortar shops found themselves sinking. Not just small businesses, but chains too. And GameStop was one of them. People can easily buy their games online and plenty of gamers have been doing that for years now. So what's really keeping GameStop in business? We'll touch more on this a bit later, but this was the question on investors' minds as well. So they began betting against the company, expecting it to fail. And they have every right to do that. And the public at large has every right to disagree. And that's exactly what they did, louder than ever before in recent memory. Members of r slash Wall Street Bets started buying up stock at a ridiculously rapid pace, encouraging others to do the same. The rising stock price seriously messed up the people that were betting against it as they effectively lost the bet. Although I've explained short selling before, let me give a brief recap. An investor buys stock from a lender, then sells it to a different buyer at market price. Imagine you borrowed a jacket from a friend. You say, okay, just give me the jacket back next week. And you say, no problem, will do. Then you go on the market and sell that jacket for $10. You're betting that the jacket or that stock is going to be worth less money when it comes time to buy it back. But in the short squeeze scenario, that jacket suddenly became extremely popular. And now when you go to rebuy that jacket, it now costs $20. So you have to shell an additional $10 that you weren't counting on spending in order to give your friend the jacket that you owe them. The public made GameStop stock, the jacket, very popular. This is what makes short selling or betting against companies so risky, and it was not paying off for these investors in a big way. But I mean, good for the public, seriously. Investors have been playing games with Wall Street for years, and this was a monumental moment when the public became, well, part of the game. Quote, people on Wall Street only care about the rules when they're the ones getting hurt. American workers have known for years the Wall Street system is broken. They've been paying the price, Senator Brown said in a statement. It's time for the SEC, which regulates US stock markets and Congress to make the economy work for everyone, not just Wall Street. Robinhood, the investing app where many people were buying these stocks also became a focus of controversy when they moved to restrict buying GameStop stocks. So much for a fair and free market, right? When you put red tape in place for the public, it certainly doesn't seem like Robinhood is all about helping the little guy as their namesake would suggest. And of course, this led to a ton of backlash and scrutiny, an extremely volatile market, and it honestly taught a lot of people about the market itself as we all were holed inside watching this happen in real time. But why bring any of this up? I've already actually spoke about this in more detail during my Robinhood episode, so why the recap? Well, because GameStop was also a focal point of the controversy. It wasn't their fault people were short selling or squeezing their stock necessarily, but the ordeal still put GameStop under a new lens. People were paying attention to them again, but unfortunately, many didn't like what they actually saw. So today, let's take a look at GameStop's legacy on the corporate casket. And if you love episodes like these, want more of them, want them without ads, want them early, then maybe you should check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash Illuminati. You're gonna find an amazing community, amazing benefits, and I mean, an amazing Patreon. Love the word amazing today. So check it out, patreon.com slash Illuminati. In order to really understand GameStop's issues, we also have to take a look at their golden era to see how things eventually went downhill. Now, they started off as a software retailer in the 1980s and by 1987 had seriously established a name for themselves and even started selling Nintendo games. From there, they started expanding. Dozens of new stores opened and then their stock plummeted again. Yeah, progress isn't always a straight line. Remember that. 
it has many ups and downs. 1990 wasn't kind to Babbage, the GameStop baby, but when GameStop was incorporated in 2001 and went public in 2002, things were finally looking up. More stores opened and voila, enter GameStop's golden years. There's no shortage of articles or forums out there that long for the time when GameStop was the place to be in the early 2000s. Who doesn't remember all these choices, all the new games coming out, the frosted tip employees selling Pokemon cards? But the reality is that while we might like to look at our childhoods through rose-colored glasses, they weren't exactly the best business even 20 years ago. And yes, it has been that long. As some members of Reset Era remember, GameStop was an absolute monopoly that bought up any other mom and pop stores, consuming the American shopping mall with its appetite. Quote, GameStop would go on to buy out and close down each and every one of its major competitors in the dedicated gaming retail space. The shame of it all is this, GameStop was the worst of all of them, even back then. And frankly, GameStop has only continually gotten worse as time rolled on post-monopolistic expansion. I can't help but wonder how different things would have been if instead Baggages or Funko Land had become the dominant force in gaming retail. Now, maybe you didn't see it that way as a 12-year-old buying their very first Nintendo 3DS, but GameStop thoroughly enjoyed having no competition for quite some time, and they seemed to enjoy gobbling up their rivals even more. This was their business model. This is who GameStop was, and the way they operate behind the scenes has never been all that squeaky clean either. Take the fundamental way they make money, for example, secondhand games. That doesn't mean that they don't make money through selling games, but secondhand games is where the real money is. Now, that market is toothless, as Total Retail calls it, thanks to digital distribution. Once upon a time, though, GameStop made their money because kids turned over their games for dirt cheap, and I'll be real, something about that doesn't sit right with me. Think about it. GameStop made a ton of money by giving actual children and adults, but a lot of kids, less than they deserved for their games. That's simply a matter of fact. They relied on this gap for profit. And seriously, you'd think that these games are cars with how fast they depreciated. One employee in 2012 even went so far as to say they thought GameStop's buyback model would be illegal if it were government regulated. You could effectively buy a new game for $60, walk out the door, then only get $18 to $25 back when you sell it but GameStop is still happy to charge $50 for the used copy, double what they gave you. And no, before anyone says, oh, well, that's just how pawn shops operate, it's not actually the same. At a pawn shop or wherever you sell something used to a shop, really, you're going to get less than what they sell it for. The pawn shop or buyer pays rent on their space, advertising for their shop, employee wages, so they have to charge more or they don't get paid. Plus, you know, they're regulated. GameStop, however, is not a pawn shop. A video game doesn't take up a lot of space and the markup is still ridiculously high. They aren't buying used games from kids at a fair price and their trade-ins are just as bad. The unnamed employee told Forbes about it, quote, I'm not even going to go into hardware trade-ins. The current trade-in value of the just released PlayStation Vita is $100 and they sell it used for 200. Talk about a profit margin. But simply put, it's an even worse racket, something that would be illegal if it involves something the government regulated. So yeah, they really don't need to say more for us to know how greedy it is. It's taking advantage of customers, not a haven for gamers like we may like to believe. It's never truly been the latter. Hell, even if you do manage to get a good deal buying a used game from GameStop, there's not actually a guarantee of quality. Employees allegedly do not test trade-ins to ensure they work, despite this being one of their primary money makers. But don't worry, maybe you spring for a new game to avoid that, right? Well, you're also not guaranteed a new game because employees supposedly opened and played games then sold them as brand new anyway. But things still get seedier and more buyers are taken advantage of through new and creative ways. One Nintendo Wii U game, Xenoblade Chronicles, was released in 2012. Not many copies were printed and it only sold via the Nintendo website and GameStop. Seemingly in order to take advantage of the hype and rarity, GameStop printed a bunch more and then sold them as used for $90. As Kotaku wrote at the time, quote, it'd be one thing to sell a game for $90 because it's very rare, but when GameStop is the only retailer with access to inventory, and when that inventory has suddenly been restocked, this sort of price inflation is obscene. Not only did GameStop fake the rarity and inflate the price, but with them being a monopoly, they knew that customers who wanted the physical copy would have no real choice but to hand over their money at this asinine price to get it. And they're supposed to be for gamers? 
No way. They're for themselves, just like any other business we've spoken about. To top it all off, they're absolutely not for their employees either. Though GameStop's golden era was pretty much over by 2017, they weren't done messing with and harming consumers. Not by a long shot. Kotaku wrote about one of their new programs at the time, one that basically required employees to lie to customers in order to function. As you may have guessed from the title card, it was called The Circle of Life and gave GameStop stores different quotas for pre-orders, reward card subscriptions, used game sales, and trade-ins. On the surface, this may not sound like a terrible idea because you don't want one store to focus on just one way of making money. It's important to have a variety of income streams, right? Well, the trouble is that this isn't about just making money in a variety of ways, but it's effectively punishing GameStop employees if they don't make enough profit. If a store's quota for used game sales is 30% and the store sells $1,000 worth of merchandise, GameStop expects at least 300 of that merchandise to be pre-owned. GameStop has threatened to fire people who don't hit their quotas too, making employees feel the pressure to lie to customers and get them to subscribe for a rewards card, pre-order another game, and buy a new game. If you've ever walked into a GameStop, bought a new game and left, then you've knocked these percentages out of favor, even if you're literally bringing in money for the company. They care more about those percentages apparently. And in order to keep those percentages intact, employees have even said that they don't have brand new systems in stock when they do, simply because they don't wanna take a giant hit on pre-owned numbers. And seriously, think about that for a moment. Employees will actively avoid making a $400 sale because they fear for their jobs. How ass backward is that? This policy is completely warped, especially when you consider that pre-owned games are going to cost far less than a brand new console. Expecting them to somehow balance each other out is ridiculous. I'd understand if GameStop said like, hey, we wanna make X amount of dollars on pre-owned games, but pushing for these things to be equal and then threatening employees' jobs in the process, I think that's just excessive, just to put it politely. You're punishing employees for selling new products, like, come on. I'm sure even a child can understand how ridiculous this policy is. And no, while I do not condone the employees lying about what's actually in stock versus not, I think it's really hard to blame them. As one employee stated, quote, we also tell customers we don't have copies of new games in stock when they are on sale. For example, Watch Dogs 2 is currently $29.99 new and $54.99 pre-owned. We just tell them we don't have the new one in stock and shuffle them out the door. Customers are pushed to pay more for a pre-owned game than a new copy that's sitting in the back that employees insist does not exist. Yeah, by like all means, be annoyed at the employee, sure, but be more annoyed at the company that made this the only way to meet their stupid policy number game. Employees have complained about this too and banded together to share tips on how not to get fired and hit circle of life numbers. Still, during game launch events, employees lied about what was in stock. And those that did sell new games during launches said they were quote, fucked and had to sell way more pre-owned games to make up for it. So let's just get this straight. GameStop was no longer in their golden age of the early 2000s. Digital gaming became more and more popular and by 2017, they needed to make more money. So they put a policy in place that led to employees saying that they didn't have new consoles or releases in stock, effectively making them lose money and customers in order to meet their quota. Again, I think even a child could see how dumb this is. More and more stories came out after it became clear just how damaging this policy is, with just about each and every employee admitting that though they didn't wanna lie to customers, they were more afraid of losing their jobs if they didn't. One assistant manager at the time said that their situation was the norm. Every time a new console or multiple new titles are released at once, the full-time workers get nervous about hitting their numbers. Quote, the worst part is the fact that all of my staff wants to do right by the guests, and we all try to do that as much as possible. But when we're faced with either losing our jobs or selling a product that a guest doesn't want, nine times out of 10, we'll sell something other than what the guests want. This assistant manager admitted that everyone working at their location was a used car salesman. Everyone who hadn't put in their two weeks notice, that is. Another assistant manager at a Midwest GameStop said they were directly told by higher management to mislead people. According to them, during an assistant leader conference call, one employee asked why pre-owned stock didn't have lower prices to incentivize customers to buy it and what could be done to overcome circle of life hurdles. Quote, our district manager straight up told her to direct our guests to the pre-owned items in question, talk up the value of buying pre-owned and simply omit mentioning any sale prices. In the specific example she used, Watch Dogs 2, our guest would have wound up spending $25 more than they had to. 
maximize sales and profit while making service matter my ass. And again, these are direct quotes by confirmed employees. Even for those stores that refused to lie, morale was down, numbers suffered, and the company culture became toxic. I'm confident that if GameStop simply communicated with their staff and asked what they thought about the circle of life numbers and policy enforcement, they would have been met with a resounding, this sucks, and told point blank how much damage this was really doing. Hell, even if they didn't ask, you'd think they would notice how harmful it was based on their own numbers. And it wasn't until all of these complaints were actually made public that their circle of life policy ended, but by then the damage was more than done. Now, I'm not saying that companies don't make mistakes and maybe for some of you, this policy is just one big mistake, but it was around for a while, vocalized as a point of contention among employees and it led to write-ups, firings and hours being cut back. It hurt the livelihood of the employees and there's no real oopsie, let me put a bandage on it for that. GameStop shot itself in the foot, I think that's pretty clear. However, have they been able to contain that bleed? How are they actually still in business these days and what's next for them? Let's be brutally honest here. GameStop's future doesn't look bright. Some even say that after so many years of bad business practices and monopolizing brick and mortar video game stores, GameStop is doomed to fail. An article from Games Industry Biz says this is no secret as they haven't been able to really embrace or adapt to digital distribution. Though GameStop did launch a digital distribution store for PC games in 2006, and they did try to emulate Amazon at one point, nothing has clicked for them. The death of retail has been an issue since the advent of the internet, but GameStop is especially prone to this with their business model and products. Now more than ever, we're seeing a slowdown. After all, that Reddit short squeeze thing wasn't going to last forever. It was a meme stock and a temporary boost. As one former board member put it, there is no articulated strategy for their improvement whatsoever. Leadership says they aren't about to make it public because they don't want anyone to steal it, but this former board member and I aren't really buying that. Management simply doesn't seem to have a plan. If they do, then it sure isn't working at the moment. The other issue at play here is that leadership isn't consistent. On average, GameStop gets a new CEO every single year. The fifth one in five years left this past June, causing a plummet in share prices. And honestly, I can't blame anyone for losing faith in the company when this keeps happening. Imagine it. You're invested in a business's improvement and leadership tells you they have a plan to pull it out from the ground and then they vanish. New leadership comes in, instills some hope, and then they bounce too. Wouldn't you eventually stop hoping? I mean, I probably would. And worse yet, there's allegedly been little to no investor communication with the only consistency at the company being changes at the top. In addition to five CEOs, they've had three different CFOs too. One analyst, Workwitz from Jeffries, said that these changes make it hard to form an opinion of the company at all. And Michael Pachter of Wedbush Securities says that GameStop is doomed, quote, the lack of a clear direction and the callous termination of former Amazon executive and GameStop CEO, Furlong all but ensures executive chairman, Cohen will have difficulty attracting a qualified replacement. Here's what another analyst said to Yahoo Finance. Yeah, I mean, the what happened yesterday between the shakeup at the top and the financial results of the company just highlighted to us instability. You know, this time last year, it was gonna be a push towards e-commerce that didn't really work out. So uh, reportedly, uh, Mr. Cohen pivoted back towards in-store dynamics and that hasn't helped. With so many CEOs and upper management being let go, it seems like the way GameStop as a company treats its employees has extended all the way to the top. But whether you think of GameStop as a nothing company after they were a meme stock, or you think of them as genuinely having potential, it's a shame that even after so many years and years in business, they're really harming themselves more than anyone else. As of writing this, GameStop's stock is also on track to hit its lowest point in two and a half years, ever since they became a meme stock in 2021. I can't say for sure if this means the public simply isn't as interested in GameStop as a whole anymore, but at the very least, we've seen that GameStop hasn't even been able to take advantage of the massive opportunity that came their way. For quite some time, they made headlines, but nothing really changed. They promised to become the Amazon of video games. And as a gamer myself, I don't think they've done that in the slightest. 
Forbes is also predicting their demise, saying that GameStop will collapse in on itself soon enough. Gifted analysts featured in their articles are saying it, former employees say it, the public says it. Is anyone rooting for GameStop at this point? At least, is anyone rooting for them for any reason other than nostalgia? The thing is, I don't want GameStop to crash and burn. I just want them to change. I just want them to actually speak to their employees, customers, learn about their market and do better. But that alone seems to be way too much to ask. I don't know if GameStop is truly doomed or not, but I don't think they'll ever be the icon and popular mall shopping spot they once were. But what do you think? Let me know in those comments down below if you believe GameStop is doomed to die or just waiting for their next comeback. But with all of that being said, that's where we're ending today's episode. I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following and subscribing to stay up to date with all the latest episodes. As always, I really appreciate you spending some of your time here with me today and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.